to look at whether we are really caused by the gods or we are so blessed that we have not been able to find our feet. We respect the smallholders. If I has proposed the kind of farmers that we should have, they should be productive, profitable, and sustainable. Farming should avoid vulnerabilities. It is not the type that we are having now, and it should be able to support livelihoods. And it should not deplete, rather, it should restore. That is a farming system that is sustainable. But we have not achieved that. There are impending issues. We respect the health of the agricultural sector. Little can be done if surplus food production is not available. I will explain this concept. In development economics, if you have the majority of your population in the agricultural sector, it means that you are not a developed economy. The reason is that what those people are doing, machines can do those things. The more efficient you are, the more you will release labor from the primary sector to the secondary and tertiary sector and free them for better productivity. We are yet to achieve that. Smallholders are resource poor. They are aging without replacement. Young men do not want to go into farming because we are still using brute force to do what machines can do. I will keep on referring to cassava throughout this lecture because of my passion for that crop. I have told you what has been done in the oil sector, in the palm oil sector. There are several other crops that can give us the same result. I choose to focus on cassava today because of the time constraints. Agricultural production, economic and resource utilization to the rescue. The role we play is in the rescue of the resource poor farmer who is not able to help himself. The typical farmer in a Nigerian village is only farming because his opportunity cost is near zero. If he has an opportunity to do something else, he will abandon the farm. Some are farming because they were born into farming and they think they don't have any other choice. But elsewhere, farming is a passport to prosperity. Here, if you tell someone that you are going back to the village to farm, they will mourn for you as if you are taking a vow of poverty. It's past not to be so. The specific theoretical models that are involved in our practice has to do with majorly the marginal principle of resource utilization. This is what I will focus on in this study. How we are able to apply this principle in dealing with the issues of technical, allocative, and economic efficiencies. So the agricultural economists, we are not just satisfied with technical efficiencies, which basically talk about possibilities in production. We are more interested in the naira and color of that possibility. A farmer, no matter the grammar you present to him, will not accept your recommendation if it will not give him more money. They are that smart. So that is what we do. The evidence is from my research. We, I, I will run through several, but for time factor, I'm going to focus mainly on efficiency, estimations, and analysis. We use mainly um, that the uh, cost method of data collection. Uh, one good thing about this method of data collection is that it takes the burden from the farmer. You that have been trained on measurement and evaluation, you go through the process of production with him and get the right data so that your analysis will be as correct as possible. That is what we have done, and I have applied the stochastic frontier production function copiously in several of my studies. The very first one here is the one done by Makara and Mira 2006. You can see the picture that we have here. That is how we are farming. And that is what we saw in the field. And we did our estimations and it was not surprising that none of the production factors of land, labor, and planting material was used efficiently. Farmers were getting something out of the land. And I will explain this. In Nigeria today, the highest
you can get on the average from cassava farm is between 10 and 15 tons per hectare. Compare that with what you get from a Vietnamese farmer or a farmer from Thailand who will get up to 50 or 60 tons per hectare from the same cassava. What are they doing differently? Our farmers don't, they don't really till the soil for cassava planting in this part of the country. They just plant. In fact, cassava is the, about the most ubiquitous crop that we can talk about. Where cassava does not grow, don't farm there. You just put it there, cassava will survive. It will give you anything. In fact, I was shot in 2018. I was in the bushes of forest states, and I met farmers who have never heard of cassava varieties that can be harvested within six to eight months. They were still living their cassava for three years, and that is a vow of poverty. You can never be rich carrying out such practices because you will be weeding, you will be maintaining your farm for three years, and you will get 10,000 tons from that hectare. How will you make money from that? What should be done, what was recommended here, is you see, if you, if you pulverize the soil, a, a plow, a tractor mounted plow can do that. One tractor can plow 10 hectares of land in a day. How many human beings can do that? And when that is done, it loses the soil. And when you put any root and tuber crop, tuberization will be enhanced. And you will see that we will exceed what we are getting currently. Another problem with our cassava uh, production is that Nigeria is currently the highest producer of cassava in the world. We are also the highest consumer of cassava. <laughs> now, what do we call, how do we consume cassava? We don't consume it as there are several products from cassava. From cassava, you can get industrial starch. From cassava, you can get all manner of product. There is no part of cassava that you can throw away. The leaves of cassava, they are as rich as alfalfa leaves in protein. But we throw them away. We will come back to all this and we will see how they are affecting our productivity. The same thing with yam. These are these estimations we have done for yam. Again, the farmers were not efficient in their use of farm resources, both in Delta and in Kogi states. The same thing, we looked at dry season amount production, and it was also found out that the farmers were not efficient. We applied the linear programming technique in estimating farm level efficiencies for cocoa product. That is another crop that I'm interested in because I saw my father's cocoa farm as a boy and I saw how good the man did it. He was the elite farmer. But when we went to the field, all those practices are gone. The produce buyers were always looking for my father. I saw the quality of um, cocoa beans from my father's fermentation process. I didn't understand until I got to the Department of Agronomy in UI and I now knew why he was always getting the A cocoa products because we go through the process. Our findings show that these farmers are not even encouraged to do that because in those days they were paid premium price for grade A products. My father had the early amazing um, variety in his farm as early as then. But today, whether you have grade A or grade D, the produce buyers will mix everything together and pay you the same amount. So it is interesting, after this study, we advised the German firm that part sponsored the study that one of the ways they can use in enhancing productivity and efficiency is to establish cocoa processing facilities 
in uh, those states, in those states, in the Luji, these are the Coco Bells of the South South. And they sharply disagree with us. And they advise us to do everything possible to encourage the farmers to go back to grade A production because they are only interested in buying the primary production. Nobody will come and develop your country for you. Germany, Switzerland, these are the countries with the highest earnings from the chocolate industry. They don't grow cocoa. We even heard now that China is going into cocoa production. Meanwhile, that same farm that I mentioned, we visited it recently with some of my family members. The community people are ready to demarcate it into housing units. And it is happening all over in many of our, our uh, plantation communities. We are giving up our plantations for housing units. Instead of encouraging the development of commodity chains for those products, and getting our way out of our current level of, of inadequacies. There were other studies that were done on these efficiencies, and the result, the conclusion is that the farmers are inefficient. They are aging without replacement, and the reason is very clear. Farming, the drudgery is high. They, they are not being replaced by the younger ones because it is too laborious. And the expected profitability is not coming out. These are the kind of machines that we, sh we should be using. I will talk about Brazil briefly. Brazil has completely automated the production of cassava. There is a video making the round from China where the production of dairy has been auto automated. And I said jokingly recently that if we are not careful, we Nigeria is the highest consumer of dairy in the world. We may start importing dairy from China. Because it's a matter of efficiency. Think of it. How many old women will be available in the next five, ten years to fry dairy the way we are doing it? It's high time we left that method and we developed and easy. And these methods have been developed, but they have not gotten to the level of the processes. So we will talk about some of this. I will talk about Brazil. Like I said, Brazil had a major crisis in the early 70s. Brazil was so poor that it could not afford fossil fuel. They gave a mandate. It was a military regime. They mandated plant breeders to come up with the best cane sugar variety that would solve the problem. And in less than two, three years, from 50 varieties, they developed 550 area-specific cane sugar varieties. Today, Brazil is the highest producer of ethanol from cane sugar. The highest producer of ethanol in the world is the US. They get theirs from sweet corn, but Brazil gets theirs from cane sugar. Many of you are not aware that cassava is not from Nigeria, it didn't originate from here. So I want to prove to you that no, no blood cost us. Cassava came from Latin America, and today we are the highest producer. We have simply not done the right thing with it. That cane sugar, I have done consultancy for the National Sugar Company. There is no part, even in the those states, those varieties from Brazil, we tried here. Cane sugar is just like grass, almost like cassava in, in its proliferation. But we have not taken this thing seriously. And there is so much that can come out of it. We cannot talk about Brazil today as one of the poorest countries in the world. What we can do is to make the best use of what we have. We also looked at marketing efficiencies, profitability and viability of farm enterprises. The idea here is that a farmer can just be there as far as he's getting money from his production, he thinks he's doing well. But is that enterprise viable? What are the things that can be done to improve on what he can get from his farm level operations? So profit economically is optimal by the time the, the mathematics and the econometrics that are involved, they are beyond the farmer at the farm level. What we do is to determine this point of optimum 
I recommend for implementation. We now went into the issue of food and nutrition security and poverty studies. A lot of studies were done here. But I will focus on the anchor borough program because this is very interesting. And at this point, Madam Vice Chancellor, we will begin to see the real problem with our agriculture. This program is a pro -pro poor program. It is designed to solve the poorest of the poor, the problem that we are having. And we estimated, and at the end of the findings, we were able to see that it did not achieve the objective of improving welfare of the dominant resource poor farming households in Nigeria. So, curiously, why was this not, not done? We looked at similar pro poor interventions. Some of you will remember some of these uh, interventions. I didn't bother with the Green Revolution, the Operation Feed the Nation. This is NAGA, Day 3, Cassava Multiplication Program, Roots and Silver Expansion Program. I am particularly interested in the National Special Program on Food Security. And I'm sure most people in this audience would have seen these vehicles between 2002 and 2006, dotting every space in Nigeria with, you see young men, young women with fancy suits everywhere. But after four years, did we solve the food security problem in Nigeria? Will we say we are better off today than we were before the program was initiated? Madam Vice Chancellor, it seems to me that we are very good in conceptualizing programs and interventions. When you look at the conceptual notes of those programs, you can't fault it. It should solve the problem that is directed at. But most times, it never does. And we, I refer to one of uh, my seniors, Professor, late Professor Ida Chawa. He, he made very interesting conclusions that we will see much later. But we looked at another intervention. This time, the World Bank model that was used to deliver a poor, pro poor intervention using the CSDP um, community driven development, which is a top, it's a bottom top approach. The idea here is you meet the community people, find out what their problems are, and they will identify what the intervention will be. You will, they will have a buy-in of about 10% of the cost. The maximum cost was, for this project was 10 million naira. So if the community is getting that project, they will contribute 1 million naira, not necessarily in cash. It could be in kind, it could be in land allocation, it could be in labor supply. And the result was very, very interesting. We compared the results achieved by the CSDP projects with World State Government, Niger Delta Development Commission representing the federal government, the local government areas achieved. And this was what we found. You can see from the table that for a health center, near CSDP will be spending less than five million. Local government will spend 24 million for the same health center. And it is even more interesting that the one by the local government will be abandoned. None of the CIDP projects was abandoned. They were all completed. The same thing for Bongo. Motorized Bongo will come at less than 5 million, but NDDC will spend 22 million. No drop of water will be coming out. So the idea was to demonstrate the World Bank did this thing in about 22 states, and those states was one of those states. And luckily, the current government is one of the few governors that adopted that model. And I will show you some of the results. We recommended that this approach was far more effective than any other approaches by governments. And we also said that that 10 million was too small. It should be increased to at least 100 million. That is why at the end of 2013, the CISP project stopped. 
then it's better the C4 projects. You have seen C4 projects around. If you want to see one, there's a popular uh, JTAS road. That is a CSDP project. If you go to many roads in the GRO, there are C4 projects. And the government is adopting it. The, student, the children, the community are getting value. And the projects are being delivered at a cost four or five times cheaper than what would have been done. So you would have expected that most of these are cultural interventions because this, uh, the assessment from these projects shows that farmers have access to this health centre, they have access to motorised roads, and it is improving their productivity. Now, coming back to the assessment of late Professor Ida Chaba, he asserted that policy conceptualization and implementation and policy impact assessment is highly non-linear. You, like what I said earlier, you cannot really say because it was well conceptualized, it will deliver what it is supposed to. The, he gave an example of how Ibrahim Babam, Badam Sudabangila was asked why he selected his colleague with Air Vice Marshal Larry Fonyon as the chairman for district. Something he knew nothing about. And the reason that one did that was that the man is rural, he breeds rural. That is enough to qualify him to run the project. Of course, the project failed. And these are some of the things that are done when we are seeing a project that is supposed to address food security. And it is not addressing food security because the bulk of the things you will see will be in the cities. The farmers are not used until we learn to take these things straight to the farmers, like what the central bank governor is announcing now. It was the uh, outrage that followed the announcement that led to, you know, this week we have said that it's channeling through Ministry of Agriculture, but that's still not enough. A hundred billion is much. It can do much to smallholder farmers if it goes directly to them. But I won't be surprised if those bags of fertilizers will end up with some fertilizer dealers that will end up selling to farmers. And the farmers will not now be able to afford it. Madam Vice Chancellor, there are other related studies that have been done in this. And the findings is that our farmers are not, they are not food secure. They are not nutrition secure, they suffer from multidimensional and resource poverty, and they lack critical infrastructural uh, interventions that will help them maximize their productivity as smallholder farmers. And the major recommendation is that if we are able to move away from primary production, I mentioned cassava, I mentioned cocoa. There are several other crops. We are already seeing it in oil palm. Then we will be able to get better value because the higher you move in the value chain of production, the more money you make. I'll give you an example. We are producing about 48 to 50 ton, million metric tons per, per annum from cassava. If we decide to start producing industrial start alone. The requirement for industrial start in Nigeria is put at 350,000 tons per annum. We are not able to produce 35,000. About 90% of that is imported. And we are talking of stress on foreign exchange. So what does it take? So then we have the cassava. If we start doing it in Nigeria, in Benin City, for example, virtually every cassava produced here will be swallowed up. The price of the will become very expensive and we can't afford it. So what is the solution? We have capacity to quadruple our current output. I don't know if you are understanding me. We are producing 15 tons per hectare. It is possible to multiply that by four and get 60 tons per hectare if we do the right thing. Then we have enough 
to go into industrial stuff production, to go into cassava pellets, to go into cassava chips. The export market in Nigeria is completely absent. So God has blessed us with these resources, but we are not efficient in managing them and in utilizing them and in getting the best out of them. Madam Vice-Chancellor, we have also gone into other, other uh, areas of research. My journey into collaborative research was not planned by me. It began when I was assistant dean and I was recommended by my then dean, Professor I.A. of Order, to represent the faculty in the Unibank team to Canada on education tour. It was in that tour that my eyes were opened to industry academia collaboration. It was in that tour that I met Professor Lawrence Ezemoy and the series of events that now began to happen subsequently. This led to a successful bid for the Commonwealth Professional Fellowship in 2015 and the launch of the Global Center for Global Eco Innovation in 2017. This was a replica of the same center we are used by Commonwealth Professional Fellowship at Lancaster Environment Center in the United Kingdom. Here, we are still talking about efficiency. This is, you can see in this picture, that is a British farmer, in a millionaire, a British farmer, a millionaire by pound sterling, not Naira. He, he was already a millionaire producing dairy products from cattle farm. His cattle farm now had cattle dung, which is the waste. There is normally a problem. What you are saying here is a dry digester that is converting that cattle dung mixed with potato waste to generate energy, to generate heat for houses, and the end product of biodigestion is organic fertilizer or digestive. So this became an inspiration. The following year, we also had another Commonwealth Professional Fellow, Engineer Fosal Samudiame, and together we were able to make our, our contribution to the successful bid for the eighth million pound recycling project, which was so successful that a translation project now has okay. And from the translation project, we were able to build our own biodigester here in Unibe. And the end product For the purpose of this lecture, these are some of our products. These are exotic leafy and fruit vegetables from the actual show garden, ably managed by our uh, honorable daughter, Mrs. Valerie Edosa. She has also come up with an idea of a rich soil tailored for specific crop production so that in the nearest future, if you want to grow any crop, just tell us. You won't need to buy fertilizer. We will give you a soil, a soil mix that has the nutrient requirements in your garden. Now, this idea became strong because of the current threat to our farmers by the marauding headsmen. Many of our farmers have abandoned their farms, and it is contributing to food insecurity. This again puts to one of our newest interests, which is the, the use of SAP technology. Before we get there, the future of agriculture is already with us. We are already hearing of precision agriculture, artificial intelligence. Countries are already applying this. And we are applying it in Nigeria. If you try to apply it in Nigeria, you may not get the right result mainly because these technologies are also capital intensive and it is for highly trained personnel. Our production system is dominated by smallholder farmers who are not that educated. So the idea would be to carry them along and this should be a gradual project. 
You cannot wish this technology away, but we can have a seamless transition because they are aging, the younger ones can learn some of this and will become more efficient to them. My current area of interest is what I'm talking about now. I'm making all together because we are coming back to urban agriculture. We may not practice our own urban agriculture the way the Western world is practicing it because the Western world, most times, they are high-income communities. We are not a high-income community. If you use artificial intelligence, if you use high-grade technology to produce tomatoes and cassava in Nigeria, you need a segment, segmented market to stay afloat. Because if you go to a new market, you will need tomatoes that is produced locally, that you can't compete with in terms of price. So we must also bridge that. Now, with respect to their production, we have achieved very, very interesting results. We have been able to get close to 12 kilograms from SAR technology. And I will warn us, when a new idea comes, everybody embraces it. This is part of the dilemma of a small holder. He embraces it and he doesn't know what he is going to do with the outcome when problem starts. That is why we are carrying out the study. And we want to look at the efficiencies, where you can maximize your output and where you can put your strength in. What we have already done is so interesting that you can get 1,200 shivers from a 100 feet by 100 feet, that is a foot plus in the room. And that is amazing with respect to use of space. And we also want to see how you can save labor and make it less labor intensive. It is not yet at the stage where we can transmit it to farmers. It's still at the on, on station trial stage. There are several opportunities. The new city is highly populous, almost 2 million persons, the, the fourth largest population wise in Nigeria currently. These people must feed. So if you embrace any of this, these are some of the normal outcomes. Today we still get fed by the north. Most of the food, there is only a household in Nigeria that does not contribute up to 100 or 200 naira to the northern parts on a daily basis. This can change because the dynamics are also changing. My recommendations are very clear. We need to put in institutional support. The farmer you saw there, lamented when Britain left EU in 2016. And one of the reasons was that as rich as he was, he was still being subsidized by the EU. Here our farmers don't get such. We need institutional support. We need to solve the problem of marauding headsmen. We need to address the issue of government making blank statements, awarding 10, 100 million to farmers or 100 billion of fertilizer to farmers without asking them the details. At the end of the day, it will be recorded that such amount of money was spent, but we are not able to trace whether it actually got to the farmers or not. That must stop. Agri business schools must be set up. Agriculture is a business. It has gone beyond the level of uh, subsistence. If it is not seen as a business, it will not deliver what it's supposed to deliver. And like I said earlier, we must do enough food in southern Nigeria. We can do a better farming. The SAC technology that we talked about, you will have to irrigate. So imagine if we do that. We won't have new seasons. We won't have uh, 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 seasons of surplus. We will just have straight seasons like we have in some other countries. And we must develop our commodity value chain. I picked cassava, I picked the chocolate industries. I've already seen some form of processing that was at LG some time back. We are, they are already processing cocoa beans into powder. We can do more than that. The chocolate business is a multi-billion dollar business. And nothing stops us as one of the highest producers of cocoa beans from getting into it. Conclusion, it has been observed that there is a huge dichotomy between research findings and what eventually gets to the farmers. We must bridge this gap 
Small holders must be carried along. We cannot wish them away. A critical mass of more than about 90% responsible for the food that we are producing cannot be wished away. We must carry them along. We cannot also wish away modern and cultural practices. We must find a way to factor them into our current level of practice so that with time we will become more efficient and more productive. You can start as an individual with agriculture as a hobby, then you, you now take it as a business and we carry our destiny in our hands. I will reiterate at this point that we are not caused by the gods. We carry our collective destiny in our hands. Madam Vice Chancellor, I want to at this point acknowledge God Almighty. I stand here as an embodiment of God's grace and the good will of men. So many persons have contributed to my emergence today. I thank my parents, my first teachers. I thank Madam Vice Chancellor for appointing me as Director Centre for Distance Learning and for this great opportunity, despite all the threats that this lecture held today. Madam Vice Chancellor, I'm grateful. I'm very grateful to the former Vice Chancellor, Professor O.G. Oshimi and my former dean, Professor I.A. Obogodo, and the Vice Chancellor of the Indonesian University, Professor Lawrence Ozamoni. These three people were my voter to my, to, to fashion my pathway to collaborative research, because when I was recommended, the Vice Chancellor approved and the, the, the trip was funded. That is where I was, where I was able to get to here. Yeah. With respect to collaborative research, I thank the former Vice Chancellor, Professor F. F. Lorimese, for announcing my promotions. I acknowledge my other teachers, my elder brother, Mr. Gabriel, who was also my teacher in my third year in the Blue College. I, I thank my BSc project supervisor, <laughs> Professor Elmo Akoruda, who recent loss in the cold hands of death on the 16th of September 2023 is still fresh and painful. I acknowledge the very reverend J.B. Tomakini, who was my MSc supervisor for his care in my journey, and my PhD supervisor, Professor Patrick Osaitiara, for standing my hands and introducing me to the lucrative world of consultancy. I'm grateful to my dean, Professor D.N. Zeko and Sammy Moa, Professor Obi Zeko, my head of department, Professor Mrs. N.J. Kulenikon, other staff and students of the department and faculty. You know, I cannot mention everybody's name, but if you, if you get the booklet, everything is there. And I try to mention everybody's name. The Secretary family, I can see many of them. Dr. Andrew is there. I acknowledge all of you. I acknowledge the staff of the Center for Distance Learning, particularly Mr. Franklin Robertson, who was lost. He was so instrumental to my success as the director. I thank the University Fitness Team, ably led by my DVC Academic. I can, I can see many of them. I thank my Ecoba class of 86. I can see many of them, ably led by by our own class captain, Augustus Hene. I thank my students. My students are wonderful, particularly the graduate students. They did so much. I'm very grateful. I'm very grateful to Revolution in the way, not only for its mutual impact, but equally for its exemplary and unique leadership style. I'm grateful to the Heritage family. I'm grateful to the Mokai dynasty and the Obiame dynasty. I can see many of you here. And to my proverb 31 wives, my joy, my sweet mother of my two loving children, and Professor Emma and I cannot thank you enough for all you do to make life easy. I thank you for the peace that you give that makes me want to come home.
Please come on stage. 
tomorrow's validation lecture by Professor Wan Bufi Ashime. And the time for that is 11 a.m. prompt. And we expect her to be seated at 10 a.m. Madam Vice Chancellor, Omar, please permit me to recognize the presence of some people here this evening. Please put your hands together from Mrs. George from the USA. Please rise for me. 